What's up, chat? What's up, YouTube, man? How's it going? Really appreciate you guys. If you watch on the YouTube, please go ahead and hit that like button. Comment below on what you think of the podcast, what questions you could have for Rex, and maybe he'll check those out, answer them as well. I appreciate you guys coming by here. This is the Nita Podcast. This is episode 24, man. 24 straight weeks of Tuesday night podcast action. And this one uh, actually has been something that I really wanted to do for a while now, and that's uh, really talk to somebody that was involved in Madden and somebody that we all knew well and really appreciate, and that is Rex, the man himself. Rex, I really appreciate you joining the podcast and giving us a couple minutes of your time to talk about Madden and everything that's involved with it. You hear me? Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, basically, uh, pretty much – a lot of me reaching out to you and I reached out to Clint as well, uh, pretty much centered around, you know, the patches that came up and how that kind of involves. But first I want to say, like, what started you in, in into gaming? Like, how did that become part of your life? Was this something you wanted to do? I, I'm I'm thinking myself, like, I mean, you a lot older than me, so I didn't think that if this was when you were a kid, was this a career choice for you? Or when did that become a part of your life this this largely? Yeah, I was a gamer as a kid all the way back to the, uh, I remember like my dad brought an Atari 2600 home for Christmas and that's how it all started. I'm sure he mm-hmm. regrets that decision Yeah. Um, you know, all the way through from the Atari to the uh, old 8-bit NES. Um, and I started to get serious about it uh, in college. I was a communications major, but I did my minor in child psychology and I, I wrote my thesis this paper on uh, the effects of video games on children. And, um, you know, I, I had a corporate communications job coming out of college, but uh, with six months, I left that job and went and got a, a tester job with Acclaim. Acclaim Entertainment was in New York. And uh, I worked on games like Turok and All-Star Baseball and NFL Quarterback. Uh, that kind of started my career, and I've been in it ever since. Okay, okay. And so, like, when you started, was like Madden, like were you, obviously you played football, so were you always was Madden always like kind of the pinnacle of where you wanted to go with gaming? Was that always like something that y- you would wish you had opportunity to work with? You know, I, I never saw that as an option. Uh, I was really into uh, Madden and NCAA starting back in college because you know I played football uh, for Marist One Double A, and uh, we were constantly playing on the Genesis, uh, always PvP. Uh, you know, competitive, uh, Mm -hmm. head-to-head. But but I never saw it as a career option. I was always into shooters was my main thing, and that's what I knew. I was a level designer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I never really saw an option for transitioning level design into sports gaming, but um, I got an opportunity, and I took it. So, yeah, I mean, it was was kind of a dream come true because NCAA football was always my favorite, one of my favorite franchises of all time. Spent, you know, 60, 80 hours every single year on my franchise in NCAA. Um, I played Madden, but primarily head-to-head uh, and with roommates and stuff like that over the years. Um, I also was into uh, 2K on the Dreamcast. Uh, I had a bunch of roommates when I was living in Arizona at the time, and we rocked that game all the time. Uh, but, yeah, I, I never expected to get a job in sports gaming. I didn't think the uh, FPS skills would translate. Mm-hmm. But they gave me an opportunity, and so it kind of just fell into my lap. Yeah, but talk about NCAA because obviously, as a Madden player for you know 15 years, there's always something we played pretty much only the first month until Madden came out. But I will tell you the online franchise or the online dynasty. One year we really locked into that. It was a great time. And were you were you around the EA when they still had NCAA? Yeah, so I. I was there for uh, NCAA 13 and NCAA 14. Yeah. Um, and I, my job was gameplay creative director. And so I, at those times, I had to build gameplay both for Madden and NCAA. Mm-hmm. So I got to work a lot with the team, uh, with Jeff Lure, who was the creative director of NCAA. At the, a guy named Craig Ostrander, who was the EP of NCAA. Uh, um, we all worked pretty closely together. Uh, NCA 14 was the year where we really committed a lot of resources. We redid the option. Um, Oregon Ducks and Chip Kelly were big at the time. Mm-hmm. So we built the, uh, the spread option playbook, which was probably one of the most successful playbooks in Madden and NCAA history. Um, so, yeah, that, it, was, uh, it was a great, great time for me. Okay, for sure. So uh, now why did essentially EA move away from the NCA franchise? 
Uh, so with a big company like EA, it's all about risk assessment. Uh -huh. And, and uh, with all the stuff that went on with the, uh, the lawsuits, um, it just became, I guess, legally not worth the risk of continuing. In other words, like the profits that were brought in by that part of the business were not risk uh, worth the risks of the lawsuits that could happen. They were afraid they were going to get sued by all the different um, now, don't get it twisted. I'm sure that if EA had had the opportunity to pay players, they would have gladly done so. Um, they do so for all their other sports licenses. Um, mm -hmm. But the, because of the NCA and the way it's structured, that just wasn't an option. So we're hopeful that, you know, as, as time goes on, you see more government people start getting interested in getting college athletes paid. And more and more people think that this is something that needs to happen. In my opinion, that paves the way for NCA to hopefully come back. As soon as EA is able to pay players for their likeness, they're going to do it. They're going to jump right back. So essentially they would wind up paying each individual player and then have their name on the game rather than it was before where it was just a number and you had to download the roster. Yeah, that would be my guess. I don't, I don't think they'd get back into it unless they could do that. Um, because even if they did, you know, random generation or, or player editing, uh, you still open yourself up back to that risk again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. But yeah, that was definitely something it kind of made the summer go by a little bit faster. And when you got that one month on NCAA, what at this point would, as far back as they've pushed the Madden release, I mean, uh, NCAA would probably be the beginning of July would be pretty cool. But, uh, anyway, so then we, we got to get to Madden and, and pretty much ultimately we, I want to understand, like, what, like, who do you guys make the Madden game for, essentially? Like, who is your your target audience of the Madden game? When you, when you know, when you de develop it, when you want people to play, when who are you targeting the most? Or what what demographic of gamer or people, honestly? It all depends on who you talk to. I mean, I think different people within the organization have different priorities and different people they want to take. For example, Example, if, if I'm the executive producer of Mutt, uh, my audience is very different than, you know, the guy who's working on Longshot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think at the top, you know, a game that's top five uh, best selling in North America, you want to target as big an audience as possible. Uh, um, you want to target casuals. You want to target laps. You want to target core. You want to target competitive. You want to target simulation. Um because all those people are viable uh, within the Madden community. Um, and, you know, I think in order for them to continue to be successful, um, you know, th that focus needs to get a little tighter because over the last three years, especially, I feel like uh, the resources within have been spread too thin trying to cater to everybody. And, uh, you know, when it's kind of that, that classic phrase, when you try to please everybody, you end up pleasing nobody. Oh, yeah, um, sure. So you know, I think a little bit more focus on the uh, the core would be appropriate because, you know, those are the pe people that have been loyal and buy the game. Every and so, you know, from my perspective, I'd love to see a renewed focus on giving those people what they want and, and deserve. Now, ultimately, when you were there, how much control did you have over the game in general? Like what was essentially your job when it came to Madden? So I, I had control of uh, gameplay. I was uh -huh. the gameplay creative director um, for the first five years I was there. Um, the last year or so, it's when I transitioned to have more of a franchise level creative, which was kind of like oversight over all the creative. And that, that was part of our process of trying to align everything against the singular vision instead of like five different teams all building their own uh, and uh, but you know, during most of my time there, I was mainly focused on gameplay. And uh, in terms of control, the way it works is um, people will pitch what creative they're interested in investing in. Um, but what ultimately happens is only so many resources to go around. And so mm -hmm. ultimately, it came down to like, who has the most effective pitch, who does marketing want to get behind, who did the executive producers and the business guys think has the best idea for the year. And ultimately that's the one, those are the ones that get fun. Idea, idea as far as what, like different content in the game, like long shot is an idea. Is that something that was pitched and then, you know, they agreed on it. Is that what you mean by idea? Yeah, that's right. Right. Uh, different features like Mutt would come in and want to do like, uh, 
you know, uh, training points or something like, like that mm-hmm. and gameplay, uh, uh, you know, like um, real player motion. And, and based on the strength of those creative pitches, it would sort of indicate how they spread the resources around and what they decided to invest. And every year ideas get pitched that we just don't either have time for, we didn't have resources, and those things either get dropped or we hold them for another year. Okay, so now you, I feel like you, when you started and to where when you ended, I feel like Mutt really multiplied by a thousand. I mean, would you agree with that assessment? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, Mutt just started when I got there. I, yeah. can't, I think the first year was 12. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So 13, you know, was my real first year there. It was only the second year of Mutt, and it really took off from underneath us, which was. Uh, it was sort of counter to what I originally w- wanted to invest in. I was very heavy on uh, authentic simulation. I came from franchise mode. It's where I mainly invested my time. Mm-hmm. And there was sort of this predominant attitude when I got there that uh, competitive Madden was very hardcore and built for a, a small segment of our users that were really, really good at the game and knew all the glitches and the ch- and. And um, whereas franchise mode was, you know, probably our most played mode. And so a lot of my investment, uh, along with Clint, who started the same year, uh, was about building, you know, an authentic simulation. And it wasn't until like, Mutt took off and we realized, like, the identity of Mutt largely built around competitive gameplay. Mm-hmm. And then later on, a year later, when the MCS got and esports started, that all of that started to shift underneath us. Yeah, so then you start, I, I would assume that, you know, Mutt, obviously Mutt probably is I, is the biggest, you know, money maker for the entire company as far as Madden's concerned. So is that something that, the, you know, the, the front office or whatever would push you more to, you know, re- really incorporate the Mutt ideas more than some of the other ideas as far as gameplay or, you know, c- CFM and so on and so forth? Yeah, I you know, the Mutt team was always growing, but, um, you know, they function a little bit different. They're like a live service team. So a, a big portion of their team is focused on like, you know, the next event, the next promote. Uh, it's a lot of front end stuff. Um, I think, you know, the juxtaposition of understanding that gameplay was directly in support of was something that took them a little while to wrap their heads around. And it took honestly us uh, in gameplay. We had to shift away from our simulation kind of focus and start building towards um you know supporting madden ultimate team Mm -hmm. a great example of that is a lot of the content that mutt puts out throughout the year we don't even see that stuff uh during development because you know we add it during the year so it's like we 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 had this classic conversation about like the big cards like the 99 moss that comes out to be like the the bojacks and stuff like that with the chemistries Mm -hmm. when we're in alpha and we're kind of getting ready to launch the game we haven't seen any of that stuff yet we don't see it until like midway through the year and so we have less time to kind of prepare for what kind of impact that stuff has on game okay so that's why so that would explain kind of how the aggressive catching this year maybe kind of got a little bit out of hand once they put this Super Moss and Super Calvin in the game rather than just a standard, you know, 88 spec catch player. Would that translate to that problem? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just aggressive catch. It's like everything from like, you know, uh, you know, a blown up spin move or a guy who's got um, secure tackler versus some guy who's got 99 spin plus a fake out cam. Uh, all those like, systems trying to work together uh it's it's really complicated and it doesn't get as much testing time as it probably needs Mm -hmm. um and and so that's kind of why you see some of the outcomes that you do and probably also supports there seems to be a deterioration throughout the year in core sentiment um because the game always seems to come out at launch and everyone's like really happy and says it's playing really well and the more this stuff comes out uh things start to deteriorate yeah, for sure. I've always thought that way, too, about Madden is that, one, when the game starts, nobody really knows how to play or nobody knows, like, the stuff that works very well or the stuff that's overpowered or anything. And then b- both the combination of these new players coming out and people getting more hip to what's good at the game will, will generally deteriorate the quality of the game, essentially. And uh, that's that's pretty yeah. much how I, I always felt. Yeah. 
I feel like, like social media also like kind of took off on us and, and we didn't uh, we didn't really expect that like all the YouTubers and, and the strategy guides and people putting out their uh, their ebooks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It starts to collapse the meta, whereas now every you know playing what the most popular ebook is, or they're they're playing what they see on YouTube or on Twitch, and it, it sort of like condenses everybody to the same play style. And in my opinion, that kind of hurts the game. We never really saw that coming. It, it happened so fast that yeah. um, you know it's something we had to react to. Uh, um, but it was it was tough. I'm gonna see. I, I, that's an argument that a lot of people have, you know, and, and my argument to me is like, what's, what's the difference to, you know, somebody watching the Patriots play and say, oh, they put Amendola on a little whip route. Let me try that with one of my receivers. You know, I feel like football is just similar to Madden. They say it's a copycat league. That's just how Madden is. I don't see why that, that would be such a, a huge problem. I think it's because the, the gameplay especially isn't at the point yet where you can have, uh, an effective counter to every single sh- you know what I'm saying it's like when certain routes become money routes and certain formations become just what you play in my opinion it's largely because we haven't invested enough or they haven't invested enough in sort of the counter plays and the counter behaviors that are necessary in order to ensure that every single offensive concept has a defensive counter it's something that Clint and I talked about all yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, for sure. I definitely uh, the one thing I do want to talk about is when we were down there for the competitive summit was a uh, Madden before Madden eighteen. The one thing you had told us was that the game, they make the game, they don't make the game hard until a month into the game. They keep the game a little easier. You know, so people first get it, they have more fun or they want to play it more. But then when the first patch comes. Bang, that's when they tune the game to kind of ideally how they want to have it. You hear me? Uh, I'm sorry, you cut out there. You finished that last part? Uh, my part was, yeah, like I said, I was down there. You said that, you know, the first month of the game, the game's a lot easier, you know, so people, essentially you want more people playing it, you know, and then once 30-day patch comes, then that's when you might tighten the game up and make it more, you know, what you guys want completely. Yeah, well, I think, you know, with the patches, a lot of it is reacting to what we're seeing in the community and what you guys are complaining about and what's happening with um, a lot of the patches are kind of driven by that. It's it's not only kind of like, you know, the bugs we shipped, uh, but it's mostly just reacting to what we're seeing online. Mm Mm-hmm. No, you good? Yeah, I'm trying to plug a headset and hope my audio gets better. No, you put a headset on, you'll be all right. So, chat, like I said, man, if you guys have any questions, man, let me know. We're going to try to cover everything from patches to tuning to, you know, I've always wanted to know did they throughout the year make the players worse so I had to buy new cards, stuff like that. So, any questions you guys have, man, please put them in the chat. They will be answered in their entirety dda of course i mean we will get to that that's definitely i don't know how i feel about that i personally feel like the whole dda thing people just blame that for everything but i do feel like it's definitely something uh that would make sense to put in the game you know if i was making a game <laughs> honestly with setback like if, this, I'm, if i'm making dubby's video game right I want as many people as possible playing the game, you know, so if little Johnny down the street's getting blasted, <laughs> right, I'm going to make him all better now? Just game a little strong. You good? Can you hear me better? I mean, I, I hear you all right. All right. So I'll tell you something about, you know, little Johnny, and I know Toke talks about this all the time. Uh, um, when we started MCS, uh, one of the things that was brought up to me was, and this is, you know, brought up to me by an executive was if we're going to invest in esports and we're going to put all this money into, um, you know, making sure that this, this, this thing takes off, they wanted the game to be less complicated. They wanted to do things like make sure that it's not just the top 1% who can lurk. 
And that's kind of what birthed Ballhawk. And, uh, you know, it birthed the nano detection system is trying to make sure that competitive Madden was accessible to a larger amount of people so that the investment that they were making in, in the MCS uh, could grow and, and that it wouldn't be reserved for like, you know, the best top 1% of all Madden players. And so, you know, that was sort of the executive mandate. It's like, if we're going to invest in this thing, uh, gameplay team needs to go out of its way to make sure that, you know, everyone feels like they have a chance to compete. Um, now we, the way we kind of took that direction and what we did with it, I'm sure a lot of people will be like, well, that you were wrong, but I, I just want you to understand strategically and from an executive business position, what the motivation was behind stuff like that. Um, and, you know, the other part of it, I think if you think about something like, uh, let's take Madden 16 and what, what happened with uh, Stiff uh, winning the championship by throwing, uh, you know, that bomb to Gronk who caught it among three three of uh, problems. To yeah. Um, a competitive player will look at that and be like, you know, a game shouldn't end that way. A championship shouldn't be won that way. But you got to understand that, like, you know, if you're an executive who's primary direct, make the game accessible. And being able to lob streaks to Gronk is going to make the game accessible to a much larger pool of players. And so that was deemed as a win. And that was sort of my aha moment where I realized right after that happened, Stiff came up to me and he gives me this big hug. Right. This happened in the audience. He gives me a huge hug and he says, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I knew in that moment that we had fucked up. Right. I knew in that moment that something wasn't right about how that had played out. And um, but, you know, I also had a senior producer, my boss, coming to me and saying, my nephew just loves calling Hail Mary four verts and throwing it up to Gronk and just aggressive catching on mossing on everybody. And I'm like, you know, I you got to there's no way that I can please both masters. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, we all have bosses. And so if, if my boss was thrilled at the way the aggressive catch and the catch mechanics and ball hawk turned out, um, you know, that was kind of what we had to roll with, even though that was the beginning of me understanding that we were actually damaging uh, high level competitive. See, so, so pretty much stiff is little Johnny. He's the same person. <laughs> I think like any competitive player is going to take advantage of the flaws that we put in the game and being able to throw and hold a button and, and moss three guys is unfortunately, you know, how you played that year. And uh, it wasn't until the following year where we started to like work on the SWAT mechanic and build that counter uh, that we were able to kind of like respond to what we were seeing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of knew right after or midway through Madden 16 that we had started to push the game in the wrong direction uh, based on our emphasis in esports. Um, but not everybody there shared my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it makes sense. I've always said that Madden is too complicated. It really is. I mean, and obviously, I'm always talking to Madden players who play it, so they don't understand that it's really too complicated. I've always, uh, you know, made the comparison, try to teach your girlfriend how to play Madden or try to teach them how to play Rocket League or, or Fortnite or whatever it may be. Madden is probably the most complicated game. And because of it, I don't think it really has an audience in kids, you know what I mean, because it is too complicated. And, and I mean, if you're going to, you know, want more people playing the game, you definitely have to make it easier or make an easier mode. And that's what I talk about. Talk about going into the three different styles of play between the arcade, the simulation, and the competitive what, when, when, when did that decision? So um, that was something my, one of my the exact time, and I had been talking about for quite some time. My original concern with doing that was, you know, get, the, the size of the gameplay team wasn't really big enough to support all three simultaneously, and that was my main concern. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, once we had a good plan in place, uh, we we decided to. But, um, you know, looking back now, I'm like even things like the nano system, let's take that for an example. And you might ask yourself, why wouldn't you put that back on in competitive play? And it's because like when you have an NFL executive and, and all, all these executives from EA sitting in the audience watching Mike Scrape or Double Loop Screamers just die. And 
And they're like, that doesn't look like real football. Why is a guy flying through the A-gap on every play? It doesn't matter whether it's competitive or casual or simulation. They feel like that's a bad look. And so, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why it's it's tough to uh, it's tough to continue to uh, you know push competitive in the direction we'd like to or we want so or I wanted to. Essentially, a lot of the decision made is how this game is going to look on competitive men. How is it going to look? Now, did that, does that go into you guys? You know, trying to make bunch less. Does that so essentially when you're sitting in an audience, you say, and you see everybody running bunch or so on and so forth. So is that that just as disheartening as somebody running through the a gap and sacking the quarterback it is for me i mean it was for me i, I don't know if it um you know if you watch it on esp and you're sitting in a bar and you're you know just some casual person i'm sure it's fine but you know if you're a an avid watcher and you, you kind of watch every game and you watch all the tournaments and stuff it does feel like a flaw. At least it does to me. I'm not sure that everybody shares that opinion, but the fact that the game doesn't sort of uh, allow for for all these various play styles and 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 people to develop their own unique way of playing the game, uh, and you can make some arguments. You know, I, I know the uh, VY Electrify had a sort of a unique style in the last tournament and, and problem back in the day with his fullback dive offense. Uh, I think that's actually good for the game. Um, and I just feel like over time we, we've we've lost a little bit. Of it. Yeah, I mean, well, for me personally, I mean, what what would go into okay? Now I feel like if something is a little, I feel like you've removed more stuff out of other formations than they have out of bunch, you know. And I don't know how much you were involved in. Okay, this is too good. Let's take that out of the game or let's change this. I remember when I went man bold, it was like four or five offenses. There were tons of different offenses that people ran. And, for instance, like tight flex was one. They had a C route that was kind of unguardable. And that's what made that offense kind of, you know, usable. And then they would take that out and take this out and take that out. I, does what, what decisions go into what gets taken out, what gets changed so it's not as effective as it is in the next year? Yeah. Yeah, I would always try to opt for build a defensive counter to the thing super effective or uber effective. I think in some cases when we realize that, you know, the investment it would take to build the defensive counter, like for example, if we were to try to build something to stop, uh, the investment would be so significant that it would eat up all of our resources. And so sort of what, I, let's call it the easy out would be, you know, just take slant outs out of the um and uh and so that's how uh, so sometimes we we feel like we have an opportunity uh like building a match defense to take away mountain routes or, or over the middle stuff mm -hmm. um and sometimes we just realize like hey this play is too effective and we don't have enough time or resources to build an effective defensive counter so let's just remove the play until we can get back to building the defensive counter to this okay now in, in that instance somebody has to realize the more plays we, we remove, the more likely everybody that's good is going to have to run bunch. For instance, Madden 18, the year after Madden 17, they had one play that beat all these zones, you know, so you kind of forced everybody to be in that one play, you know. At some point you have to realize, you know, these guys are going to find something that's effective. If we yep. want the gameplay to be spread out and look better for the NFL executives, maybe let's leave multiple things in there so they can pick and choose which one they want to run it will look that much better and they won't be stuck with everybody running bunch i mean yeah i think most of that is just due to compress and how all the coverage uh is is less likely to have an effective response compressed sets and again it comes down to flaws in the defensive ai or rules that that don't exist yet or systems or behaviors that we don't have in our ai yet that allows compressed sets to be more effective than other things. And so everybody abandons the other things and just runs the thing that's most effective. And again, if, if you talk about like, hey, what kind of investment would it take to make sure that compressed sets were as well defended as other sets, it's massive. Like there's multiple features, multiple systems, multiple AI behaviors. And I, I know they're working on that stuff, but it's going to come very slowly like in a trickle, unfortunately, because they're working on other things that – getting into another topic are much more marketable really hardcore fundamental football yeah well they talked about i mean 
obviously the one thing Madden is up against more than any other game is the release date every year. You know, you just have X amount of months to make make a new game pretty much every year or tune another game and make it seem like a new game and so on and so forth. Talk about the challenges uh, as far as that's concerned compared to all the other games you've worked on in your career. I, you know, I, I would love to tell you that, that the time pressure was a – it really wasn't. It's, it's not really about how much time we had because it's a fixed quantity. You know what it is. And so you can take a set amount of work and fit it into that bubble. Um, the problem was, is uh, for me, at least my perspective, when marketing comes in or an executive comes in and says, well, I don't know if the story is big enough. I don't know if there's enough back of box bullets, you know, and, and then they start to inflate it or they come in and they do this thing called an audible, which is like you're halfway through the year, you're executing just fine against what you wanted to. And then someone comes in and no, do this thing instead. And that blows things up. And that, that becomes the problem because now you start chasing something else. It pulls resources away from the thing you were trying to focus on. Um, and ultimately, like, they're just going to make this big, like, list of features every year because they're worried that if that feature list is small, that people aren't going to come back and you'll get a bunch of laps. And they're sort of suck, stuck in this cycle of believing that the longer that bullet list is, the more likely it is that people will come back. And unfortunately, you know, a long bullet list doesn't necessarily mean a good game. Mm -hmm. And so when you're trying to chase all these different ideas, instead of really just focusing on make the best football game possible, it distracts you. Um, and this goes all the way back to before my time. If you, if you go back uh, in history during the Ian Cummings years, they used to talk about one and done where they put in a feature like ProTac, right? And then the following go away or a year after it would just disappear because they didn't care about it anymore because they had already marketed it and they can't sell the same feature so as soon as it like comes out of the the back of box marketing focus it loses all its emphasis right mm -hmm. so they could put like millions and millions of dollars into long shot and market the hell out of it and then two years later it's going to be gone and and it's like well what'd you get for all that investment and, and they was, well, well, we sold copies the year that it existed instead of, yeah, we've invested in our long-term future. They just, they just don't think, unfortunately, uh, about investing in these long-term initiatives because they want to see an immediate payoff uh, by building these big back-of-box stories every year. Mm -hmm. No, that's what I mean. Sheesh. Well, let's talk about, okay, let's talk about the patches and essentially where do you – like you put the game out, say it's August second. You put the game out, boom. Where do you get the data? Where do you get the feedback? Where is like, do you learn what we need to fix in the game? Yeah, good question. Um, so you know, I, I kind of was the tip of the spear when it came to this. You know, the the, the patch era sort of started uh, with Mutt and and treating a live service because live service gaming is all about retention. 